Ever wonder how pilots have always known exactly where they were, even before GPS? Or how they navigate through busy airspace while avoiding other aircraft? Even well before satellites were around, pilots were navigating with electronic equipment. And you might be surprised to know that most of that tech is still around and in use almost 80 years later. Stick around for another digital voyage as Geezer Geek Pilot and I take to the skies to see how legacy navigation systems compare to modern avionics and find out why these classic tools haven't been left behind, even in the age of touchscreens and moving maps. On this episode, I'm joined by Wayne, also known as Geezer Geek Pilot on YouTube. Wayne has flown his single-engine Diamond Star DA-40 across North, Central, and South America, including a remarkable journey from California to Cuba and onward to Guatemala. Wayne and I took to the skies in a Cessna 182 over Santa Barbara, California to, among other things, compare an iPad's cutting-edge flight planning and navigation capabilities with the old-school ground-based VHF radio navigation system that's still keeping planes on course around the world today. Later, we'll dive into how pilots stay aware of traffic in some of the busiest airspace and how we use technology to stay ahead of the weather. Before departing Santa Barbara Airport, we set up two completely different ways of navigating. One designed before computers and satellites even existed, and another that lives on a tablet and communicates with modern avionics via Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. Skyway 90317, runway 25, full length, clear for takeoff, 1250 at 11. 25, clear for takeoff, 90317. Start on the iPad, design our flight plan, and then push this to the panel. I press panel, I get a light that lights up over here, and it says, flight plan import, new imported flight plan available for preview. I can press this and it will show me that I've planned our flight from Santa Barbara to Gaviota to Paso Robles. Uh, it's sort of like Apple CarPlay, but instead of for music and for phone calls, it's for navigation. We take for granted just how ubiquitous GPS is today, but pilots were flying the world without getting lost way before satellite navigation. The original way to navigate at night was lights on the ground and arrows in the daytime, large concrete arrows that were blazed into the countryside across the United States. And pilots would look out the window and literally try to find these arrows to know that they were on course. And that marked the trail across the country for the early airmail flyers. During the daytime, they could see the concrete arrows. At nighttime, they could see the light beacons. Concrete arrows and lighted beacons were better than no wayfinders, but they soon gave way to an amazingly sophisticated analog radio technology. Very high frequency omnidirectional range beacons, or VORs for short, send out radio signals from ground-based stations. Pilots tune in the beacons and use a needle display in the cockpit to show if they're on course. No satellites, no internet, no moving map, just generally reliable ground-based radio signals sending Morse code and a little bit of magic. What if we navigate to Morro Bay? Let's see if we can pick up the Morro Bay VOR. MQO is the symbol for it, the frequency 112.4. We'll tune that in to our number two navigation radio here and you'll see the needle swung and we can identify it once we've positively identified that radio signal we can then spin where it says navigate to it's going to be 215 215 degrees so we'll turn to 215 degrees 
Believe it or not, pilots still rely on these simple, post-war era radio beacons. Why? Partly because GPS has a few serious weaknesses. It's vulnerable to jamming and spoofing, and since GPS relies entirely on a constellation of satellites in Earth's orbit, even a solar flare could take down the entire system. These aren't just hypothetical concerns, they're real-world risks that could mean the difference between a routine flight and a critical situation. Well, that brings up the whole spoofing of GPS signals, which yeah. in some parts of the world, Eastern Europe in particular, is a pretty common occurrence, given the wars in that area, that uh, some of the combatants intentionally spoof the, uh, the GPS signals. And then you have to revert our, our present day reversion, in that case, are these VOR ground-based beacons, and ultimately back to the old magnetic compass, even. But it isn't just in war zones where GPS signals can't always be trusted. In a notable case in 2012, pilots received erroneous GPS signals as they arrived and departed Newark's Liberty Airport. So whether it's a malicious attack, like in a wartime, or a negligence situation, I heard a story of a driver of a truck and his boss, the fleet boss, was uh, tracking all of these all of his assets with GPS, and he didn't want to be tracked. He liked to take his lunch and watch the airplane take off and land. So he put a GPS jammer in his van, figuring, well, the boss won't know that I'm over by the airport, and I'll just disappear from his map. So he'd park under the approach end of one of the runways and eat his lunch and watch the airplane. Little did he know he was jamming the GPS system and uh, causing the aircraft to lose their ability to navigate wow. using the GPS system. For now, all pilots are still trained to use these legacy VOR radio navigation systems, so even if GPS fails, they're not left guessing where they are. The VOR system is so robust that even if multiple stations were down, others could still provide coverage across hundreds of miles. I have another piece of legacy equipment in here called the Distance Measuring Equipment, the DME. And uh, also similar to how a police radar works, this is a microwave-based system that bounces a signal between the VOR station, the ground-based radio beacon, and my aircraft. And it's an active system, so we're pinging this station and then determining how far away we are and how quickly we're approaching that station. So even without GPS, we can use the DME, or the distance measuring equipment, to determine not just our distance from the station that we have tuned in, but also our ground speed as we approach that station. So we'll tune in the Gaviota radio beacon, the Gaviota VOR. And this should come into... So it says that we're 32.8 nautical miles from Gaviota. And that agrees with our GPS system, 32.6. So within a quarter mile, half mile accuracy here between a legacy system from World War II days and modern GPS navigation, which is accurate to within a few meters. Yes. In fact, there's a technical difference between the two. DME is a slant distance. Yeah. So as we get closer to the station, this number will stay larger because it's a slant distance instead of just the horizontal. The, the GPS distance will go to zero as we cross the station. This will never be zero unless we cross the station on the ground, on the surface. Yeah, correct. Cool stuff. And again, a good backup. The FAA plans to continue decommissioning VORs. For now, they say they'll keep enough of them around to provide a basic backup for GPS navigation. Whether or not that will be enough to be useful is still debated. But for now, pilots still have them as a tool when they need them. So when you go on your phone, you download an app, Flight Radar 24, uh, Flight Aware, Flight Aware uh, ADSB Exchange. All of these apps and these websites are picking up data from an open system called ADSB. ADSB is a transponder on the aircraft that outputs its position. So we know where we are because the GPS knows where we are. So let's send that information out on a beacon, out on a transponder, and let everybody else know where we are so we can avoid them. And let air traffic control know where, they, where we are so they can keep planes separated. So on the screen right now, we have our traffic display here. And we can see that we're, we're in the middle here, and we have an aircraft at 200 feet below us, about four or five nautical miles to our east. And we have another one below us 
2,600 feet to our west. And we can see that, that correlates with this aircraft here, November 172 Echo Papa is passing behind us. And then we have other aircraft over here as well. So that, that gives us good situational awareness and we know where they are because their internal GPS on their aircraft is reporting their position to us. And likewise, if we're in their cockpit, they can see where we are. Behind me is an aeronautical chart of the southern half of California. Each light represents an airport, stretching from Monterey in the top left to Palm Springs in the bottom right. The colors indicate the current flight conditions. Red means low clouds and poor visibility. Blue represents marginal conditions. And green means good visibility and generally clear skies. Even though the weather was great when Wayne and I flew the other day, the chart behind me shows a lot of red and blue along the coast. That's because this chart updates in real time, and what you see here is based on the latest airport observations. Weather can change quickly, which is why pilots rely on receiving up-to-date weather information. Let's go back to Santa Barbara because that's where we're going, and it'd be nice to know what the weather is there. Sometimes this time of day, we get a fog layer, a marine layer that sets up. ADSB can do more than just broadcast aircraft positions. It also links pilots to real-time weather updates. With it, we can receive updated condition reports, turbulence alerts, and even visualizations. Radar and satellite imagery is sent from the National Weather Service straight to cockpit displays without the need for expensive subscriptions or internet data links. This means pilots can track approaching storms, changing winds, and airport conditions at the touch of a screen from miles above the surface. So we can just click on Santa Barbara and go to weather, and we can see the latest weather report from 11 minutes ago. The wind was 250, so a west wind at 8 knots. Visibility was 10 statute miles, and the sky is clear. Temperature is 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So beyond textual weather, any precip around? Let's look. We'll bring up the radar, which is also fed by the ADSB system. Oh, so we don't have any down here in Santa Barbara, but Seattle, true to its reputation, <laughs> as a bunch. As a bunch of precipitation, and we can see that coming through. So if we were in a bigger plane, a faster plane, and we were going to Seattle, we'd know well in advance what we were going to encounter as we headed up to the Pacific Northwest. Very good stra uh, strategic tool. The precip weather is dated by five or six minutes. Yeah, down here it says minus 11 M, so we know that it's at least 11 minutes old. You don't want to be navigating around under clouds with it, but it's good to let you know what you can expect up ahead. You don't have to be a pilot to have fun with ADSB. The system signals are unencrypted, meaning anyone with a simple $20 USB radio receiver dongle can pick them up over the air in real time. There's a link in the description to a video from Signals Everywhere, showing how using a low-cost receiver and some free software, you can hear signals from the aircraft around your own home, just like air traffic controllers do. So we have a, uh, an autopilot, which is from the early 90s, an analog autopilot in effect was designed to track a heading and keep you at altitude. Flying today, especially in busy airspace and in inclement weather, often means relying on GPS and high-tech modern avionics. But what happens when you literally mix modern navigation with decades-old technology? It was never originally designed to interface with GPS. In fact, I don't even know if civilian GPS existed in 1993 when this was originally designed and manufactured. Somewhere along the way, some companies figured out, hey, we can actually feed this heading information from a computer. So we've got a modern GPS here made by Garmin, actually feeds this 30-something-year-old autopilot with heading information about where it wants the aircraft to steer. Back to the old chart, the paper chart. Oh, the paper chart. So when I started flying, back in my day, <laughs> 2007, back in my you're much day, older than I am. In 2007, we had paper charts, and here's a, this is an en route chart, and you can Whoa. see the whole thing covers the windscreen. <laughs> so how do you use this? Well, you get really good at folding it and figuring out which section. That's why they called it a sectional, I think, because you only look at a section at a time. And I'll bring up the same layer here on my, uh, on my iPad so you can see, you know, for example, what this looks like. Uh, here's a section, and then on the iPad, I can, I can zoom in, zoom out, and get a much clearer, accurate view without blocking my entire And that's probably screen. limited to a couple states. This is, this where, is limited whereas, to, it's gonna be a little bit of Arizona 
and uh, Nevada and Southern California. Whereas the iPad has the world. <laughs> yes. So when you flew commercially 10, 15 years ago, you would see pilots with their suitcase, and then on top of that was a big, big, big briefcase that had hundreds of paper maps. And they literally had subscriptions. You'd get a paper map subscription, and every month, every 28 days, you would have to swap out your old charts for your new charts. It was as much paper uh, management as there was flying. Instead of managing stacks of paper, pilots can download chart updates in minutes, staying current with the latest airspace changes, instrument procedures, and weather conditions. But is an iPad truly a replacement for everything? Well, maybe not quite. So the reason that we have this instrument permanently installed and don't just fly our plane with an iPad is because these have been tested to be reliable in the air uh, and they're hard. Occasionally the iPad will do something like, say, overheating, shutting down, and you just really can't have that in an airplane. So while it's very helpful to have the iPad and it's perfect for pre-flight planning, it gives you excellent awareness of the situation that you're in. It's an excellent replacement for paper charts in the cockpit but you don't want to lose it to uh, excessive heat or a battery discharge in flight. So we have permanently installed instrumentation that we have better reliability with. At this point, we've navigated hundreds of miles using a mix of vintage and modern technologies, GPS, VOR, and we even used an aging analog autopilot. But now comes the most critical phase of any flight, the approach and landing. I'm gonna disable the autopilot and we'll start our descent for Santa Barbara, now that we're crossing the mountain ridge here at the Gaviota VOR. And as we cross, you can see that the VOR display flips to to from. And that means we've crossed over the station. Even with all this tech, landing is where a pilot's skill and currency matters most. While airliners sometimes rely on fully automatic landing systems in the most extreme low visibility conditions, most small plane pilots still hand fly all the way to the ground making precise control and situational awareness essential. You want to talk about ILS? Yeah, the instrument landing system is also uh, sort of a fascinating system that's similar to the VOR. It's ground-based. It allows us to navigate laterally to line up with the runway. And it also gives us a glide slope or a path that we want to descend down, uh, sort of like a, a slide. We can use these displays here, sort of analog displays in our navigation radio, to land in the fog, land in, in the clouds, and get uh, almost to the ground, within a few hundred feet of the ground, purely by looking at two needles. We know that we're on course, both laterally and vertically, and when we break out of the clouds, we should be able to see the numbers of the runway that we're landing on. As the old pilot's adage goes, takeoffs are optional, but landings are mandatory. Even though we've been flying with technology that dates back decades, the fundamentals of a safe landing haven't changed. Manage speed, set up the right descent rate, and touch down smoothly. November 317, runway 15 right, clear to land, wind 240 at 11. Clear to land, runway 15 right, Skyline 317. Just like that, we're back on the ground. A mix of skill plus old and new technologies got us here, from legacy radio beacons to cutting edge GPS systems. And while automation and digital advancements are certainly changing aviation, in the end, a safe flight still starts and ends with the pilot. Did you hear what the heading was? <laughs> My no. tentpole stopped working. On my heading, I think. If you love forgotten and obscure technologies, vintage computers, and electronics that continue to shape our world, make sure to subscribe. Drop a comment below if you've ever tracked flights online, use old school navigation, or just love seeing classic tech still in action. And as always, see you on the next Digital Voyage. <laughs>